thank you guys for coming out in the dreary weather. Um, my name is Sarah McCree, and I'm with the Central Transmission Bank. I work in our agency relations department along with Steve Early in the back, and Matt, who is our new intern doing the hunger study. So we welcome you to the Central Transmission Bank. And if any of you are here for the first time and would like a tour afterwards, just let one of us know, and we'll give you a tour of the process. Um, so, a little a couple housekeeping things. We have fruit, coffee, juice, water in the cooler on the floor down there. If you guys need refreshments, help yourself at any time throughout the training, and we will have two, like, 10 to 15 minute breaks, I think, right, yeah. um, throughout the training. Bathrooms, there are bathrooms to your right in the warehouse, or when you first entered near the vestibule where the cemetery is, there are some restrooms out there, so whatever you guys would prefer. Um, so I'd like to welcome Judy Chambers. Um, this is our grant writing, uh, getting started with grants training. And we had her run a similar training at our annual conference. And it was um, so well taken that we decided to do it again for a smaller half day training. So we're really happy you guys were able to make it. Um, Judy Chambers is the Economic and Community Development Educator with Penn State Extension. And she has worked in the areas of land use education, leadership development, strategic planning, and local government training. In 2009-2010, she served as Penn State Extension Fellow with the County Commissioners Association of Pennsylvania. Chambers was one of, has over excuse me, 11 years experience as municipal manager, manager for two small communities, Boonesboro, Maryland, and Mercersburg, PA. She has also worked on military base as Utilities Program Manager for Letterkenny Industrial Development Authority in Chambersburg, PA. She is a graduate of Northwestern University and received a Master's Degree in Community and Economic Development from Penn State University in May 2009. So let's welcome Judy. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, thank you for that nice introduction. We are, this is going to be a very interactive, we're going to work and, and, uh, and do a lot of talking during this. There are a couple people who were here last week when we did content management, and so they already know my style, which is that I like to engage with you the whole time. So please just throw out questions, ask me what, what you want to know, talk, talk about things that are important to you as we go. And if you're someone who needs to cough you up in the middle of uh, when I'm talking, please feel free to do so, because that's an important thing to do. I'm wired for sound today, which is a new thing for me. Um, Lynn, our, the videographer here that the Central Pennsylvania Food Bank brought in, has this microphone that plugs right in, I have to show them this, plugs right <laughs> into her iPhone. And so it's not making me louder for you, but it's making me louder for her because we're trying to record this. So hopefully that will work. If I'm not loud enough for you, just tell me. I usually do not have any problems with her. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through this, this grant writing kind of 101 thing and talk about um, some of the tips and the tools of the trade for, for writing grants, a little bit about grant searching. And um, what I'd like to know before we even get started with introductions is how many folks here are actively involved in grant writing on a regular basis? Oh good, those will be my ringers and you'll be the people I'll go to to get help with this because um, I'm certainly not the only expert in the room when it comes to grant writing. So those of you who are involved, please feel free. Let's go ahead. Okay, so what we want to do today is kind of give you a basic understanding of, of grant writing, some tools and tips about putting together proposals and how you do that, and a little bit about where we find grant opportunities. Um, a little bit about grant searching. It's, uh, won't be able to give you a whole lot on that, but we'll, we'll spend some time looking. We'll go on the web together and, and take a look there. So, um, the first thing I want to do is get some introductions from you. So, would you let's just go around quickly and spend a minute doing this and tell me who you are, who, what, what organization you're with, and do, do you have a specific project in mind? Is there something that brought you here today because you are looking for money for X? 
not everybody will, will have a project, but if you have something in mind or something you'd like to think about in terms of a grant, will you share that with us and you tell us kind of how much money you think you would need for that. Um, one, of the, <coughs> one of the reasons I like to go around and have people talk about their grants is, is because you're probably hearing from other people who have similar needs. So a $300 grant or a $5,000 grant is just as important as a $1.3 million grant. It depends on what it is that you're looking to fund and how you want to do it. One of the things I heard this morning, too, was that um, a number of you have relied on donations and are seeing that that's just not a viable way in this economy to be sustainable. So you're looking for some other revenue streams that can help to support that. But certainly, in looking at grants, if we went around the room and said, who's your target? It's probably not the same. You're not competing head on for grant money. You're looking at what are the different ways um, that you can go into this. And collaborating with each other is also a very important way. You know, when we talk about grants, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it's a, a part of a larger fundraising uh, concept, a funding policy for the organization. So when you're looking at grants, you're looking at what are our other revenue streams? Do we get donations? Do we get contributions? Are there fee-based services? What is the whole package of what we're doing? Um, I have a lot of background in municipal government, and there are a number of state and federal agencies that don't give grants, but they write down loans to extremely low interest or no interest. And we, we, I used to spend a lot of time trying to explain to local officials that if you get a zero interest loan, that's like a grant. Because at that point in the market, if, if the standard cost for municipal borrowing is 6%, and you're borrowing without paying that 6%, you did get a grant for part of what you were doing there. You just didn't get a full grant. You got a partial grant. So we'll look at how we can put those things together. So Sarah's my clicker today. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Um, some of this may seem very basic. Uh, chime in if you can help out with this. But basically, there are two kinds of grants in the world. There are restricted grants and there are unrestricted grants. Some of you describe situations where you would like an unrestricted grant. You would like me to just come in and give you my check and you can do whatever you want with it. Those don't happen very often unless you're getting categorical funding streams from the state or the federal government. Um, those of you who are tied into county agencies, for instance, that money comes through and you can use it for what you need it for. But in general, the kinds of grants and foundations we're going to talk about give restricted money, which is that there's, a, there's something that you need to use it for. It might be operations, it might be staff, it might be equipment, it might be food, but there is a restricted level of purpose for it. And then we heard a couple times about matching grants already in the room. Sometimes you get 100%. Sometimes you get a grant that you need to match with uh, I think uh, you folks back there had a sliding scale, right? 10% this year and then 20%, that kind of thing. Um, or sometimes you get a challenge grant where someone says, we'll give you the money if, kind of like a matching grant, we'll give you the money if you can raise the remaining funds for it. So just being aware of what, what it is that we're looking at will help. Um, who gets grants? Public agencies are a large source of funding and one that I suspect some people in this room have already capped. But what we're going to focus on today is the private foundations because that's where you in your kinds of um, needs and your kinds of organizations are likely to find the money you need, um, whether it's 300 or 2,000 or 300,000. Um, usually a private, corporate, uh, a private foundation, somebody has money and they have put it into a foundation, and they get tax benefits for that and earn money, uh, earn uh, interest income on that, and they are obligated by tax codes to give a certain amount of that out each year as charitable contributions in order to sustain, sustain themselves as a, as a foundation. Many of these are family-based, philanthropist-based. Somebody has a lot of money and creates a foundation. You know, if you watch football right now, you're always hearing about these players and their foundations, right? They've got a lot of money. Let's put this to use in some way so they invest it. And people who do that, philanthropists and other people who develop foundations, have specific causes. There's a reason why they want to do that. They, 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 they want to work with kids. They want to get kids involved in this program. They want to make sure people aren't hungry, or they want to create better health in their community, or they want to promote the arts or whatever it is. But there are specific reasons 
why people invest their money into a foundation so that they can give it to you. And then there are all these business foundations. Um, you mentioned Walmart uh, getting a, a, a grant from there. There are a lot of, um, most of corporate America gives in some way in foundations. Often tied to a geographic area, um, and that's one of the things we'll look at. Let's go to the next slide and take a look at foundations in Pennsylvania. There are over 4,300 right now in Pennsylvania. The, the newest uh, statistics I could find, this data came from the Foundation Center, we'll talk about that in a little bit. They had $27.8 billion here in Pennsylvania, but let's see how much they actually gave, okay? Not that much, they're giving a small percentage. Why? Because these are, in order to sustain the foundation, they can't give away all their money each year. Let's keep going on this. Um, there's some real big ones, and then there are lots of small ones. But that <coughs> is for you, unless you really, unless you can squeeze into that southeast geographic designation. Most of the big, the foundations, private foundations in Pennsylvania, that are giving aren't where we are. So that's something you need to think about. Um, so your job is to go to a foundation and say, we can help you with your need. What do foundations need? Foundations need to give away their money. If you work for a foundation, your job description is find somebody to take this money off our hands. Because the reason you exist as a foundation is to give people money. Okay? We tend to forget that. We tend to forget that they have a need on their side too, which is to give the money out. This is also true for public agencies that do grant funding. So what you need to do is become a partner with them and convince them that we're the ones that you can invest money in that will accomplish what it is you are trying to do. If you're a corporation, if you're Walmart, and you just want to be able to show good deeds in the community, and these are great success stories, and you can tell your investors how you spend their money well. Um, if you're a private foundation with a philanthropist who wants to do something good in the community, and you can say, here, we'll help you, we'll, we'll help you make that happen. You're interested in, in addressing hunger, we will help you address hunger. Because if you give us our food, our, your money, if you invest in us, we will solve that problem for you, or we will work on that problem for you. So, and grant writing is a really small part of this process. We are not going to go through this flow chart, so don't worry if you can read it on your little handouts or not. The only purpose of this chart is to show you, look at all the stuff you do before you even get to writing the grant. And that's what we're going to spend some time on today. So let's go ahead. Okay, you need a project. And as we went around the room, there were some very specific projects. I want to do a fitness center. I need a walk-in freezer. I need a new kitchen. I want this kitchen. Whatever. Um, but some of you said, you know, we just need money to keep ourselves going. And what I'm going to tell you today is that there are very few people out there who are going to write you a check from a grant perspective just to keep you going. Those are the people that many of you rely on for your don donations and your contributions. If you're faith-based and you have people in your church who are doing that, that's fine. They believe in what you're doing and they write you the check. Most foundations are not going to operate that way. They're going to want to find a specific piece of what you're doing. So if you're doing a program where you're serving people food there at the, at the facility and you want a grant for that, you may need to define the boundaries of that. What is it that we want the grant for? We want the grant because we want to provide meals for this many people this year, something like that. And our needs are for food, or our needs are for warehousing, or our needs are for people, whatever. Right, now I was just going to say that looking past at the grants that Monica received, it was much easier to get the little grants for our specific children's program. The, the theory, as she was saying, you need to provide the food for the kids when they're not at school. Right. And that's a very popular. Right. So you may need to carve out a small piece of what you're doing for the grant, or you may need to divide your project into a couple of pieces. Does that make sense? We'll look at that a little more. So you need to figure out what you need your money for, and how much do you need. You know, Donald Trump walks into your organization and says, I'm ready to write a check. How much do you want? What do you tell the guy? Because you'll tell me you'll take as much as I'll give you, right? How much is that? Is it 10000 10 million? 10 billion, how much money do you really need? Because I'm going to tell you right now with a straight face that if I handed you a check for a million dollars, most of you would not be able to handle that, 
right? Your organizations aren't big enough to use that. But if I go to Kelly and say, here's $1,000 for your fitness center, she's like, that bought the brooms, you know, right? <laughs> so it's, it's not up. So it's really defining what we need. And then, are you looking for public funding or foundation funding? And again, I'm not going to be addressing public funding here. We'll go to foundation funding. Okay. If an opportunity comes your way, and this happens sometimes, has anyone ever had, in this room had somebody come to them and say, we'd like to give you a grant? This does actually happen sometimes. There are organizations in the community or, or foundations that will say, we're interested in supporting your hunger effort. So we would like to make you a grant of this much money. Um, you still need to think about why do you need the grant? How much do you need? And are there strings attached? Uh, this is something that organizations often fall uh, victim to, which is, you know, we call it chasing the money, right? There's a grant out there that we can get. It's a low-hanging fruit. We know if we apply, we can get it. But that grant is for recreational activities in the summer for kids. Well, we've already got the kids here. We're already feeding the kids. Why don't we just branch out into that? Maybe it's a good thing to do. Maybe it's not. Maybe it pulls you so far away from your core mission that you're losing your ability to do what you were originally meant to do. Enough of that lecture. Okay, <clears throat> so you need to establish a need that they like to solve problems. You need to be able to say, what is the problem? And who cares about this problem? In this room, nobody has to explain the problem about hunger in America. But imagine that I'm a foundation that doesn't know anything about it. You might need to spell it out for me What's the problem with people being, so what if kids don't get school lunches in the summertime? What's the big deal? And you might need to spell it out and talk about what's going on. What are you going to do about the problem? And here's a hint. I would guess that in most situations, you are not going to solve any problems. You are going to work on solutions to problems. You are going to help people get on their feet. But you are not going to solve hunger in your community all by yourself, right? And, and it's unrealistic to make those kinds of things. So you need to be very realistic about what is it that you think we can do? How are you going to do it? What do you need the money for? And of course, how much do you need? And several of you in this room had a pretty good idea of the ballpark because that's going to affect who you look to, okay? Kelly's not going to go to Walmart for a $1,000 grant for a $1.5 million. Is that what you said you needed? Eight. Eight. Oh, somebody needed it. What do you need? 2.5 million. 2.5 million. Okay, let's go ahead. Okay, searching for funders, back in the day before we were all on the internet, there were all these things you needed to do, one of which was to go to the foundation center and talk about that, um, and you needed to go to libraries and do hard research. That's no longer true if you have a computer or a phone and you can get online. You can do most of this yourself. Um, there are lots of softwares and directories. There are a number of sites that are by subscription, um, and you can also hire grant writing services on your own. There's a handout that came, I'm going to borrow yours for just a second, with your um, PowerPoint. And it's two sides. And on one side is just a list of sources. And this is certainly not a comprehensive list, but this is the beginning of a list of, of links to websites with grant sources on them. Now, I believe these all work because I did check them before I, before I came in. And I just told you about them. Some of these are fee-based websites where you have to join the website. If they're on here, it's because they also have some free information. Most of these websites have some tips. Maybe they have a free webinar. Maybe they've got a sample grant proposal or something that you can look at, and you don't have to join them. And then on the back, the Foundation Center is like the godfather of foundation funding in America. They're based in uh, New York, and they have uh, uh, branch locations. There's one in Washington, D.C. Back in the day, you used to have to go to Washington, D.C. and sit down. If you're not in your head, you did that, huh? Search out, mm -hmm. sit there and search out the grants. Now you can go online for most of their information, but they also have these things called cooperating collections, which are mostly in public libraries. I just went in and searched for Harrisburg, PA, and came up with this list of libraries, Dauphin County, Lancaster Public Library, right? those places that have foundation center resources at the library for you to look at. And they're supposed to, according to the website, also have technical assistance for you there. I have not ever tried that. Has anyone tried? 
I've used the Lancaster Public Library. Okay. And you make, an, you make an appointment because they have kind of limited hours, but it's but it's wonderful. And you can email everything you find to yourself. And do they help you figure out how to do it? They do. Okay. They do. Every day when you're listening to the radio or um, reading the newspaper or, or even paying your bills, you're thinking about grant opportunities. So here's a couple of examples. This is old and we'll go up to the Adams Electric <coughs> website. But Adams County Electric, the Electric Cooperative, they've got a community foundation. And if we, we'll go look on their website a little bit. And you can just look right there. So I bet if you're an Adams Electric customer, I'm not, but I bet if you're an Adams Electric customer, when you pay your bills every once in a while, you get a newsletter or a stuffer in your bill from them or something, and it probably talks about how they've been giving money out in the community, boom, your antenna should go up right away. Um, here's a cute, uh, I was looking in the Gettysburg Times well, I was fighting the copier yesterday. I was reading the last week's worth of news there. And here on one page, McDonald's Charities names Gettysburg resident board president. Ooh, McDonald's has a charitable organization that's local enough so they're, they're appointing Pennsylvania people onto their board. You need to read that article and figure out who that is, and we'll talk a little bit about mining information. Um, preservation grant money available for historic farms. Well, you know what? Maybe you don't care about historic barns, but if you see something like that in the paper, take a look and find out, because maybe it's somebody who's funding other stuff as well. Here's one. These are a couple years old. Here's one. It was from the business page of the paper. Giant food stores um, announced their largest charitable donations ever totaling more than 13.5 million, 13 .5 million in, in cash and contributions. That was from 2007. But those little blurbs show up. They don't show up where you're looking for grants, but they show up in the business pages of your newspaper all the time. Um, here's another one, Columbia Gas, accepting grant applications. Here's one, we have a lot of churches in the room. St. James Lutheran Church gives more than $50,000 to six nonprofits. This just happened uh, earlier this, uh, last summer in Gettysburg. So, you know, you look at that and say, what is that church doing giving away $50,000? Well. They have a mission fund, a monetary stream made possible by gifts from church members, estates, wills, and family members. So they essentially have what is the equivalent of a foundation right there at their church, and they're looking for ways to spend that money. Here's one that's just a photograph. Eagles donate, I couldn't believe this. I had to read this three times. This was in yesterday's paper in Gettysburg. Eagles donate more than $100,000. I have no idea where they get $100,000. But they, they donated that much uh, to 18 organizations, including fire companies. More than $121,000. So, and again, it's just a photograph. Just a photograph with the captions. You've got to be paying attention here. Is that Eagles football or is that their school? Eagle Scouts. This is Eagles. This is an Eagles club. The social yeah, Eagles. Terms of social this is like the Elks club. Like the Elks. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I had to find out more about yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 They got $100,000 yeah. and they have that every year. Those are, when we talk about your grand antenna, that's what I'm talking about. Every day when you're walking through, paying your bills, reading this paper, whatever, have your antenna out, your ears out for, oh, where did they get money? You know, you always see those check photographs in the paper. You know, somebody's got the giant check and they're handing it to somebody. Read those. Find out, find out what's going on. Okay. Um, finding, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just really quick, back yeah. in my earlier life when I used to write a lot of grant proposals, we always found that every company has both like a corporate and a, a nonprofit uh, foundation. And if there's somewhere you shop all the time or they know you, you just go say, hey, you know, I work with this organization. Does your company have a foundation that I might be able to apply? Bingo. Yeah. And you know, if they know you, if you're a customer, they're gonna be nice. Yeah, and if it's a if if it's your local grocery store in a big chain or your right. local department store in a big chain, sometimes they like to get that money to come into their community because Philadelphia always gets all the money and they want some of it to come over no, here. So you can help them. them. Yeah, Giant just gives it every time we run out of bags to put the food in for people. The local giant store just gives us boxes yeah. full of bags. Yeah. How cool is that? That's very good. Yeah. 
Yeah. On, on those same lines, and, and I just happened to realize this, uh, back in the day, most funeral homes were privately owned. So you could go to them and get uh, tickets printed or some small donations. Nowadays, most, and this is hard to believe, but most funeral homes throughout the nation are owned by large corporations. And if you, if you find out who owns the local uh, funeral home, you can always go to the funeral home and say, hey, uh, I know who owns you, uh, how about some money? That's, uh, I wouldn't do it exactly like that. But, uh, <laughs> I don't know where he was going with that. <laughs> you have to be worried. But, but, uh, but a good example of what I'm talking about. So, Service Corporation International owns uh, funeral homes, uh, cemeteries, uh, casket companies, you name it. They, they own it. And I have gone to SCI in the past and said, I need a couple of thousand dollars. And because they have local funeral homes, and this was in the Baltimore area, because they owned local funeral homes in, in the area, that funeral home would write us a check, but it was really from the corporate office. Right, officers. right. And they, they may have a need to be putting dollars into the local community, and they may be struggling to figure out how to do that, other than few free funeral services, how do they do that? So you may be helping them with that. Those of you who have a development and fundraising background know that um, you really, it's pretty hard to insult somebody by asking them for money. You can insult them by asking for too little or not. But it's pretty hard to insult somebody by asking them for money. Because you're always telling, you know, you're, you're, you're creating the perception immediately that that person has value and assets that you would like to tap into. Doesn't mean they're going to say yes, but it, it makes the ask a little bit easier. Okay. When we're looking at these foundations then, we got to think about, do you fit what that foundation wants to do? If that foundation is about promoting arts and culture, is your food pantry a good candidate for it? Probably not. Probably going to have to find someone else. Does the funder give to your type of organization? Does it give faith-based? Does it go give to community organizations? Does it give to volunteer groups? And, and we'll look at how you find that out. And are they in your area or not? Um, how do you fit in? If this is a foundation that typically gives grants in a hundred thousand and higher category, do you want to go in for twelve thousand dollars? Because it just may not fit the way that they dole out their money. On the other hand, if you're looking for eight thousand dollars and they normally give out something in the area of five to twenty thousand, you might be right in their target area for, for funding. I cannot emphasize this enough. Talk to the funders before you begin the grant process. Call up and talk to them about what you're doing. You will find, and we will show you examples here, there are very few funding agencies, particularly at the levels we're talking about with private foundations, who won't talk to you. There are some. There are some that just say, send in your letter of, of you know, your letter proposal or your request and we'll review it. But most funders want to talk to you first. You know why? Their job is to give you the money. Right? So they want to help you make that happen. Let's go to the next one. Okay. When you're going to a local foundation, or like the funeral home example of a larger foundation, you need to find out who works for them, who's on their board. That guy from Gettysburg who just got appointed to the McDonald's Charities Foundation, you need to go find out who that is. And if I don't know him, who do I know who knows me? Who in my organization is connected to him? Who's on the same board or goes to the same church as this guy and can help us to make those connections that way? What's their history? What do they usually give? What do they give it for? What are the amounts? Are they for organizations like us? And oh, by the way, if you can go to a, a foundation that has given grants in your community before and you recognize some of the organizations they given, have given to, Unless you're really having a hostile relationship with that organization, call them up. Say, what was your experience approaching this foundation? What can you tell me? How can you help? Because many of you have projects that are once and done projects. You want to buy a piece of equipment or build a facility. So this, you're not going to be going back to that same foundation in the future. And it's a great way to get some information. Let's go ahead. Okay. Um, so you need to talk.
talk to the funder, you need to call them <coughs> up and write them and say, can we talk about the project? There are some foundations, and I'll show you in a couple minutes the Foundation for Enhancing Communities around here, that actually pretty much requires you to come in and uh, to, to have a conversation with them before you start the process. That's how serious I about it. Um, try and get a face-to-face -face meeting, but be listening as you're hearing this person talk. You're, you're really just saying, this is the project we have. This is what we're thinking about. This is the scope of funding we're looking for. This is the kind of organization we are. Is this going to be a good fit? Should we be doing this? And what would you like to see? And what would make this a strong application? And then be listening carefully. And are they using buzzwords? Are they giving you some idea of exactly what they're looking for? Take some notes on that so that you can tailor your request for what it is that they're looking for. So let's go ahead. OK, see communities. This is the umbrella organization for the Greater Harrisburg County Foundation, the Franklin County Foundation, the Perry County Foundation, or any of those sounding familiar to you, there's about seven of them. And they are all under Foundation for Enhancing Communities. These people, their purpose in life is giving away money from those foundations. And what happens is, within each county, there is a foundation and it's a bunch of different people who are local philanthropists who have put their money in a county foundation and now it's gone into the Foundation for Enhancing Communities. And some of that money is very restricted. I want to give my money in my community for firehouses. And some of that money is wide open. I just want to make this a better place for people to look. So here's 2013 grant. grant. It says click here to learn how to apply. Let's see what that says. You're supposed to review the grant requirements after reviewing the appropriate grant content guidelines, contact the program office. That's step two. You're not even supposed to get to here until you've had a conversation with these people. So that's an important thing to think about. Let us look under, uh, about the foundation. Sorry. Uh, yeah, regional foundations. Let's go here. Regional foundations. Okay, and these are the foundations that make it up. Let's go to Franklin County. That's where I was. I was trying. Okay, look what you just found. Here's the advisory board. You want to apply? They're not the people who give the money. And if I go and talk to Harold Gray and say, hey, you know, this organization's doing this great project, he might say, you know, we have a process and we have a grant review committee and I need to step back from that. Okay, that's fine. It didn't hurt for you to let him know, but it may be somebody who can put a good word in for you. Let's scroll down. So those are all those are all individual people in the county. Who have, who have given money to the foundation. And these are the funds. These are philanthropic funds that individuals have set up or companies have set up. Look at some of these must be kind of small. Here's high school class funds. Okay. Um, there are all kinds of interesting funds in here that have been set up. And go down to total assets. Here's the money they have. And look what they just told you on their website. Here's all the people they gave to last year in 2012. So you can see that if you've got a project that's over $10,000, just might not be a good fit for the Franklin County Foundation, because you're not seeing any up there that are very big like that. But you're also seeing, you know, look, Central Pennsylvania Food Bank, how about that? Got money from this. So you might talk to Sarah and, and say, or Georgia or whomever, and say, okay, what'd you get the money for? What'd you do with it? Do you go every year? What's your experience? Where else in the greater chamber, uh, in the uh, Foundation for Enhancing Communities do you get money? Go on down. And then they have scholarships down here. So um, let's go to the next, next link I wanted to show you. But you can see that you're getting lots of information. Here's giant food stores. Somebody was talking about giant before. Okay. <coughs> this is just where you go shopping at giant food, right? This is just like if you want to find out how much lettuce costs for food. It's their regular old website. Go up to, uh, I think it's company information. Ooh, getting back to the community. Just be a little bit of a web detective. See what you can find out. And here is a whole, whole information about what they've been doing. Um, and we won't need to scroll down, but you can do the same thing here. You can find out, if you drill down into this, you can find a list of who they give to, what are they given for, that kind of thing. What else we got on that one? Charitable giving guidelines. Yeah. 
Guidelines for charitable giving. See what happens there. Oh, isn't this wonderful? They are into hunger relief, and providing for people in need, and the well-being of children. Kelly might not be your best bet, because you're going to have to stretch that fitness center to fit into hunger relief and providing food. But if I want a food pantry? <laughs> if you want a food pantry, you're good to go. But if your project is something else, and that's what I'm talking about, if your project is not clearly on target with what they're doing, then you need to find another place to ask. But they, they donate food here, and then we can buy it for 18 cents a pound. Wow. So that's predominantly where we get our meat. Okay. That's great to know. And you know what? If you're going to the Giant Foundation directly to ask for, for funding, maybe that's one of the things to point out to them, is that we already have a strong relationship with you. You are all already support our organization. Because what they don't want to think is that you're trying to double dip without help. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our very positive experiences with the giant food store in the Dairy Township area is um, they will give us uh, like ten dollar gift cards, and during our uh, special seasons like Thanksgiving and Christmas, where we make baskets for mm -hmm. our families, um, just recently we got one hundred fifty dollars worth of gift cards that we were able to distribute to our, our families in need. So they, they're very helpful. And that's really interesting because look at what they can't support. Mm -hmm. They can't support assistance for individuals, but that's not what they're doing. They're giving it to you. Right, to give out. You're giving it to you. Right. Okay, let's go back to the PowerPoint and see what else. I think I put Target. Oh, food line. Let's get food line for now. Let's go to Adam's electric. So that was interesting. I found that old brochure in my file, so I went up to the site to see, oh, let's see what they're doing now. Well, we don't want to view their allergies. They just, they just cut out a whole lot. Of, anybody live in Adams? Anybody not have heat yeah, the night before that? was on the news. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was a bad night, too. It was a real bad fix, choice. Fix yeah. their bed. I didn't live there, but I had some cold compatriots at work. Okay, let's go to my community. And community loan fund. Okay, that's a pretty wide open description here, right? Education, health, economics, public safety, it's pretty wide open. If you've got a good project, what they're saying is, if you have a good project that we think helps the community, we're game to hear about it. And when you see one with a whole shopping list like this, that should, that, that should light you up because here's your opportunity to really frame your story in a broad sense in terms of community benefit and, and get some something for it. So let's see what happens when you learn more. Okay, so you probably, we won't bother doing that, but you would download a file that would talk about finding a program or, or um, probably a grant application or something like that. So again, just be thinking about those things. Um, utility, and we can go back to PowerPoint. Utility companies like to give away money, have to give away money. Banks, anybody here have a relationship with a bank? It's getting harder to find a local bank, but every bank has. Um, it's called CRA, the Community <coughs> Investment Act, requires banks to give a certain, requires, they have to give a certain amount of their money back to the community every year, and federal auditors come in and audit those banks to find out if they have met their CRA, Community Reinvestment Act, uh, obligations. Um, you have some experience with this, Ben Lancaster? You hit the banks? I, I tried Wells Fargo with not a lot of success. Okay. okay. And some of them may do it. Of other banks. Some of them may do it in a larger area, but that's something that you might want to do, and you might need to frame that in terms of um, we know that you we know that you have a responsibility for some charitable giving in the community. Are we someone who can help you meet your obligation? That is what I that we have run into um, with some of the fundraisers that we do, um, that the banks often have their money that they can give away gone by like February, March. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, boom, you got to get in and ask them for the money pretty early on. Ooh, mm -hmm. This is a really, really good point, and it's not anywhere in my presentation, so I'm really glad you made that point. I'll have to build that in. 
There are cycles to these things. And if you miss the cycle, guess what? Put on your calendar for next year. But there are cycles. And if somebody says to you, we make all our giving by February and it's May, you probably don't want to try and muscle in and say, don't you have anything extra left? <laughs> but the correct response is, is, when should we be talking to you for next year's cycle? When would you like to see our proposal? When, when, should, when can we put that together? It doesn't hurt to say, if you get stuck with a couple extra dollars and no one can spend this year, we can help you out. Uh, is that something you always need to make a phone call for? Because they don't really put that out there in their public information that they have cycles? They don't. They don't put that out there. Remember that the first thing you want to do is talk to these people to find out if you're a good fit. So that's one of the things you're going to find out when you're talking to them is, do you have a cycle for giving? You know, will you accept an application at any time or a proposal at any time? So, yeah, that's part of that initial conversation you're having. If it's a foundation, they're going to tell you. If it's a business that has a foundation arm, they may not be as, as transparent about that. And in the business ones, the giant foods of the world and the, the Targets and the Walmarts, you may have a much harder time finding out who is on their grant review committees, who's doing the advising, who's on their boards. But what they like to talk about is where did they put the money in the community. So you should have a pretty easy time finding what other organizations got money, and how much were they getting, and was it for the same kind of thing that I want to do. Okay, yeah. If I, if I contact PNC Bank mm -hmm. and they give me some money, is it a good idea to contact uh, Wells Fargo and remind them or just just let them know what PNC has done or do we need to keep our mouth shut? You know, that's that's your call in terms of do you want to play one organization against another? But I think the other part of that question was do we want to publicize the money we've gotten? And that's a very good question. Some particularly commercial <coughs> operations are giving you money specifically because they want you to promote them in the community. They want you to say, PNC Bank just gave us this much money. But, and particularly if it's a local or, uh, a local business, sometimes they prefer not to have you broadcast that. Have you ever had somebody say, yes, we're going to help you out, but please don't put this out in the community. Don't give us any public thank you, because we don't want the rest of the world beating down our doors. So we do have to be sensitive to that. It's, it's their call initially. But if they said, yeah, have at it, you know, happy to publicize what we're doing, then why not use that to see if you can leverage some other things? Anyone have any experience with that? I, I do, actually. Yeah. I um, Prior to working here, I used to work for uh, Big Brother Big Sisters for many years. I did a lot of grant writing. I never did like a million dollar grant or something like that, but I did a lot of small grants. And we, I, I was, one of the first things I did, because I hadn't written a grant at all prior to that, so one of the things I did is first I got a template that I had on my computer that whenever I did write a grant, whether small or large, I had I made sure I went through that template and and you can get them free right on the computer. You can download it on PDF, whatever you want. And I made sure every grant that I wrote was in consistent the way it's supposed to be. Um, another thing that I would do is the gentleman mentioned funeral homes. One thing if you have a funeral director that you're comfortable with, that you're familiar with, they are directly connected to where a lot of people like to donate their money to after they pass away. And they can connect you with foundations directly. They might not say, we recommend it, don't put them involved, but they can say, you know, this gentleman passed away, he was quite wealthy, he put $100 million into this, 500000 into that. They like to support the community for these reasons, for that reason, whatever. Um, another thing you can do, what, what I did, what I was taught to do, um, uh, was to go down to the local city hall. I went to city hall. They always have records down city hall businesses that are about to open, and you can contact them. Like they may have already been approved for the space on Front Street or wherever you're at, and um, but they don't get to open until April 20th. You can write a letter to that local business because it's public record. You can write a local a, a letter to that business, whether it's a nail salon that can give you fifty dollars a year, or a big business like a, a, a carpet company that's opening up in a certain area that can give you $500 a year. Um, but that's a place you can get a lot of access to businesses who aren't, haven't been, like we used to use, dipped into yet. Yeah. And you might be, you write your proposal to them and deliver it to them prior to them even <coughs> opening. Now, because like you said, these places want to get publicity. 
so not necessarily publicity for the money, but they want their name on your brochure or something. I thank you for being a contributor, and your name is already their name is already on your first brochure that goes out to the community. Yep. Yep. It's a, it's a win win for everybody. It's a great idea, and um, particularly with large these days there aren't a lot of large businesses opening but i worked uh, i was on the board of a, a arts organization in franklin county when target distribution was announced coming to town somebody reached out to target early on and said how can we help you make an entry into the community not how can we help you with your charitable giving but how can we have an event or how can we work with you and so they developed a relationship that way and i think there was some kind of a welcome reception or something that was, they, they partnered with it and then that led to other ideas the other thing that's, that, that Steve said that reminded me is, is and this is more on the, the development side, but it never hurts to have good friends who are estate attorneys or financial advisors because the folks at the end of the year who need to dump a lot of money into a nonprofit cause real fast before tax time, that's who they go to when they want to ask you a question. Yeah. How, do you feel, how do you feel about asking for, say, what, like Coca-Cola? Coca-Cola all gives lots of money across the country, I'm sure. How do you feel about asking for a lot but expecting a little? Like, should you ask for a quarter of a million dollars, hoping to get a thousand? You know. Well, it goes back to how much they usually give. Because mm -hmm. if they don't give more than twenty-five thousand, yeah. and you ask for a half a million, <laughs> you're not going to sound like a responsible organization. Yeah, you didn't do your research. That's the you didn't do your research. So it's better to match up. Yeah, that's why I meant like a larger. Where they are. Company. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't hurt to dream. <laughs> <laughs> Steve said he, he had a grant template that he used um, all the time, and several of these websites have given you links to have information like that on there. But the bottom line is that the funder has his own way of looking for that information, throw the template out, and use his information. If he doesn't have it, use your template. <coughs> the value of having some sort of template like that is that you've always got that information front of you and then you can pull it out and put it into the right format. So a lot of people use a lot of different terminology. A pre-application is not always required. It is sometimes required for a large a large grant, particularly in the public sector. People will ask for a pre-application. A letter of intent is kind of like that and it's often a foundation will say we do not accept um, unsolicited, unsolicited proposals. But we will accept a letter of intent. So they don't want the 20 pages. They want one page that says, we are a food pantry, we are in Dauphin County, we meet this need in the community, and we are interested in developing this program. Is this something that's a good fit for you? Yeah, I read somewhere where, where it, it sounded like there was regional requirements, like it, just like a generic a template for a particular region if you were sending letters out or sending to a particular to, to, organization? Yeah, uh, to, to any organization or any foundation within a within a region. Is I, that, did, have you heard anything like that? No, only if there's some kind of umbrella group like the Foundation for Enhancing Communities which administers a whole lot of different regional funds. We saw like five okay. different regional funds there. That might be Okay, so within that. Yeah, umbrella. but the bottom line is you follow the directions they give you, right? Mm -hmm. so, and then you get an application or proposal, and usually a funder will tell you what they want exactly, but if they don't and they just want a proposal, then I'm going to show you a typical proposal um, format, and again, it's on all of these links that you can find in your website. But tap that again because there's a little message down here, I think. Yeah. These terms mean whatever your funder says they mean. So if he says a letter of intent means a full proposal, say, oh, okay, you do it. Okay. So that's the bottom line here. Let's take a look. Um, first, you've got to get organized and read all the directions. I cannot emphasize this enough. You've got to read all the directions. This is something I learned at a grant writing workshop years ago about building a model. And I do this with any major project I'm involved in, not just a, uh, a grant. I take a three ring binder and I use colored, you know, colored copy paper and I put on all the things I'm going to need in there. I'm going to need a cover letter, I'm going to need a budget, I'm going to need job descriptions, I'm going to need resumes, I'm going to need whatever I'm going to need that's required in the grant because I've read the directions. As I go through those directions, each one of those is a separate page. Okay? That colored paper does not come out of my notebook. 
until I've got the real thing ready to go. With the signatures, with the attachments, with everything it needs. And if it's not yet ready, I can put it in, but I don't take that colored paper out. And that's just my visual way of saying, this is not ready for prime time. There's still a pink sheet in the back here. What did I forget? And it's just a wonderful little mm -hmm. tool, and I highly recommend it. Also, when you first start looking at a funding application, it can be overwhelming. So that's a good way. And if you have another technique, if your technique is on the, on, on the computer, do it that way. Um, check the instructions. Some people get really, really picky about this stuff. They tell you, you have to use Times New Roman 12 point with one inch margins, single space. And they mean it. <laughs> if they say that, they actually have somebody who checks it. Okay? <laughs> a lot of places don't do that, but if they tell you that, they're, they're serious. And usually those kinds of instructions are accompanied by page limits. So what they're doing is they're keeping you from squeezing it down to eight point font so you can get all your information. <laughs> <laughs> choose a great name for your project. You don't have to choose it at the very beginning, but it's good to have a working title. And you want a working title for your project that tells people what you want. The Dolphin Food Bank does not tell me what you want. Feeding Hungry People in Harrisburg tells me what you want. You know, I, I'm just saying that may not be a great example, but finding something that, that is not just the name of your organization, but something that describes a little bit what your project is without getting too long. So the first time they read that, they're already in sync with what it is that you're going to propose to them. And then, obviously, pay attention to the deadline. So let's go ahead. Um, you want to keep, these are just sort of general guidelines for any grant that you write, or really anything you do. You want to keep the language really simple. You need to assume that the person who is reading this does not understand your world at all. So RSVP and CNN, I'm picking on you guys, but they threw out some alphabet there, okay, that we needed to wade through. Don't do that. Make sure you let people know. You can abbreviate something after you've introduced it, but if you're going to put RSVP, the way you do that is retired senior volunteer, whatever it is, retired senior volunteers, PA, parentheses, RSVP, and then you can use RSVP after that. Tables, charts, and diagrams if they're useful. Otherwise, don't blanket people with a lot of data. Usually, if you're allowed to put supporting information in, that will be in an appendix. Again, you've got to read the directions to see what they will allow you to put in. We'll look at that. Explain your abbreviations. The best thing to do for proofreading your proposal is to find some glutton for punishment, like maybe someone you're married to, <laughs> really doesn't know what you're doing with this. Get somebody who is completely removed from this to proofread it for you. Get one of your volunteers. Get somebody who, someone else in the church community, get a neighbor. Get some, say, do a good deed for me. Read through this and tell me where you tripped up, where you didn't get it. And then, Use your own judgment to see whether that's something you need to explain better. But also catch all the typos. That's important. And make a final copy. This sounds sort of like, duh. But it's amazing how much people will not do things that way. The grant instructions may say that they want it stapled. It may say that they don't want it stapled. It may say that they want an original of five copies. You know why? Because they don't want to copy it for the review committee. So you've made all the copies. If, you want, if they want an original five copies and you don't do that, you might not get reviewed because they may not bother to make the copies themselves. Let's go ahead, sir. Okay, these are the typical proposal components. If you do not get instructions that say, do these things, then this is the kind of thing you can put in that template. You're going to have a cover letter, the executive summary. What's an executive summary? Sure. Sure. Yeah, it's like one page. This tells you right up front, this is what we're doing, this is who we are, this is what we're doing, this is the need, this is what's going to cost us, here's our request, boom, boom. It's enough to grab them, right? It's like the cover letter on a resume, it's enough to grab them, bring them in. Then you need a need statement. What is the problem? You want to describe your project in terms of all of these things. What is it that you're trying to achieve? How are you going to do it? Who's going to take care of this grant and the administration of it? How much money do you need and what is it for in as much detail, we'll go over this, as possible? Who is your organization? Who are you? What's your background? Do you have experience with other grants? 
What's the conclusion? And if you get a chance to write a conclusion, that's a great place to say, so now that you know our whole story, if you give us $10,000 for the ABC organization, you're going to help deal with hunger in our community, or you're going to fill people's bellies, or whatever it is, you're going to do that. And then if you're allowed to have appendices, this is where you can put all your, your, your agency newsletters and your news articles <coughs> and your boards and all that stuff. So, the cover letter is the first thing on that list. You write that last. Okay? It's kind of like a job application, right? You have your resume, you have the application. The last thing you write is the cover letter. And this is really short. This is like maybe one paragraph if they allow a cover letter. If they don't allow a cover letter, you don't get it. The cover letter really needs to, if at all humanly possible, have a person's name as opposed to Dear Target Foundation. If you, if you can drill down, get on the web, sometimes you can call and say, <coughs> to whom should I address this application? Just ask them, and they will tell you. But if you can get a person's name on it, that's great. And it's really, really short. That's who we are. That's what we're trying to do. This is how much we want. Thank you for reading our application. Bum. So this is, you write it last, but it's easy. You, you've done all the hard work by then. And the next step is the executive summary. And again, if you get an opportunity to do this, you're just fleshing it out. Are you getting the theme here that you repeat yourself over and over and over again in the grant application? Because you've got to tell them, right? Okay. And then you get to the need statement. And this is where you have to show your understanding of the problem. This is the problem. The problem in our community is there are people who are hungry. And we need to explain how you know that and what the impact is on the community and how you have some expertise in it. And the problem is a community problem. It's not that our food pantry has you know, waiting lines out the door. That's not the problem. The problem is there are so many people, right, who need food and there are not enough services. Okay, so it's not your organization, it's them. And really try to avoid kind of, you know, all these people will starve and die and we will be stepping on the bodies in the street. Okay? Because I have a feeling that's probably a little bit of an exaggeration. But you can talk about the real impacts of what goes on when kids don't get enough to eat. So, now it's your turn to have to do some work. Um, <coughs> what I want you to do is in small groups, and you can certainly all move around to other tables and stuff. I want you to look at, this is just a little cheat sheet to help you figure out what it is I'm asking you to do. I want you to look at one of those projects that was being talked about if we went around and introduced ourselves. Thank you. Or if you want to come up with another project, let's be hypothetical and think about a project to work on. Come up with a little name for that project. Sarah, this might be on your <laughs> Yeah. Choose a title for your application and just a couple of sentences for a neat statement for it. And then somebody in your group is going to be uh, reporting back out. So, some of you aren't quite ready, but that's okay. It was just an exercise. Um, who thought this was really easy? Start easy table. Is that an easy table? <laughs> okay, I mean, who wants to go first? It wasn't hard, it wasn't difficult. But See, this group back here, what'd you come up with? <coughs> um, a, a cooking class, a summer cooking class for kids. Everybody here heard? Go ahead. Uh, where we would, we would use an organization that, that's already offering a summer camp for children, uh, for, for needy children, and um, offer uh, to come in and do um, a cooking class where we would be doing healthy healthy snacks and and the, the problem we'd be addressing is that uh, how the many ch how many children when school is out um, they don't they're not getting healthy food at home or at the school and maybe and we can teach them snacks that they can that would be healthier and, um, so your, what's your need statement? I need to statement is the, the, that um, uh, addressing the needs of, of children who are not getting healthy food at home or at school because school is out for the summer is kind of our need statement. What else do you have? That's where we were going. Yeah, okay. that's where we were going. So your need statement is there are these kids who aren't getting healthy food during the summer. Okay. 
And if you were really doing this, you would be able to quantify about how many you think that is? Right. Okay. And so what's the problem? Uh, so obesity. what? They're not getting food. So oh, oh, obesity, <laughs> diabetes, there's a diabetes, hypertension. I would, I would get that a demographic study that yes, showed we that have to, from the we schools. Have to get some in Lancaster, we have that information okay. that's, that shows the increase in health issues with the school children in the school district of Lancaster. Okay, so would you, and this is a summer program to help address so that. You so you're trying to do something during the time when they're not in school to reinforce good nutrition and health right. and because help you know in. that there are all these problems with right. it. Right, and they're not getting school lunches or breakfast. Okay, okay. 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 do you have a catchy yeah. name for your school district? Kids, or we just said kids cuisine. Kids we're not too. We're not too, you know, flashy yet. Kids cuisine. I like that. Needs yeah. a lot. Needs a lot. They get recipes and you yeah. bring them home and, you know, bring do you see how easy it is to get to the how we're going to get to the how we're going to solve the problem before you finish describing the problem? So you really need to, and I know this was hypothetical, so you didn't have all that data in front of you, but you need to tell me because yeah, I mean I'm worried about kids going hungry, but so what? What's the big deal? What'd you guys come up with? We would like to find a weekly meal to 100 homeless, low income, or no income individuals in Susquehanna Township via a mobile kitchen. Okay, what's the problem? What's the need state? Mm, there, there is an identified population in Susquehanna Township of hungry people in the community that will not access traditional services. Okay, so here she's telling me not only are they hungry, but they don't, aren't going to go to traditional services. So then you're going to talk a little bit about that. You're going to talk about, in your need statement, why these people aren't getting served by someone else. And that's really smart because as a funder, I might say, well, wait a minute, we're already putting this much money out in the community, right? What's, what's up? Why aren't these people going where, where that is? So, so in your need statement, you would build a case for these are people who are unserved. And this is why they're uncertain, because we know that they have mental health concerns or they have whatever the concerns are that are keeping them from getting into, um, or there are language barriers or whatever it is that, that are helping them. So and you're going to try and put some numbers to that too, right? Right. Okay. Who else has a, what do you guys have? Um, we did a, um, this is for the ICAM Incorporated in mm -hmm. Lancaster. And their need is to have locked storage covers so that they can secure the food purchases that have been made. Um, this, this agency shares a room with uh, people who come in during the day who are homeless and disabled. Uh, the facility is open from 12 to 8 at night and they need a place to uh, keep their food securely so that uh, it can be fairly distributed uh, during the food pantry times. This is a really good example. And you know, this, this is a hard exercise. Please don't feel as we critique these that, that you've not done it correctly. But this is about honing these statements in so that you've really got a good grant in. Because the project is very discreet, we know exactly what they need. They need to create some secure food storage areas because of the situation they're in, right? But the need statement is about the problem that the organization is having. So how could we rewrite, revise that need statement so that it would interest me in the problem that I want to solve because I put my money into a foundation to deal with hunger in the community. So what could, what could they say? How could you review that? Any ideas? They could start by giving some examples of how much they had stolen last year. We didn't want to use the word stealing because we felt that was a negative. But that's still the organizational That's still the organizational problem. I think what you're getting at is is they're serving they're serving a clientele who has physical disabilities perhaps who have an inability to take care of their food needs. 
and in the this community. operation helps them in the fulfill that need. Right. And one particular in problem in servicing that need is that we need to secure this food. Right. The real problem you're dealing with is serving the people. That's the need statement. These are the people who come to us, and this is why they come to us, and this is why they're not getting their needs served somewhere else, and this is why we need to address <laughs> that. Our method of dealing with that is going to involve getting some secure food storage so that we can lock up our food. But the problem, the need statement, is clients. Who are you, who are you helping? Why do you exist? You don't exist because you like locked files. You exist because you want to feed people. But if you can create that locked storage, that will help you. So there's a little, and this is really a big trigger for all of us, is because we're all so busy solving the problem that our methods end up in the need statement. But the need statement is just paint the picture. Tell me what's wrong and what you're going to do about it. Does that make sense? I think you have a good project that's really, um, it's got such a bounded, described, discrete piece to it. You know exactly what you want and what it's going to cost and when this will be over and how, how you can put it in place. So I think it's, it's got some good prospects. So how do you with it? Well, I, I put for our need is, is serving food to the disabled and homeless in, and then you would probably name the church or the organization. And then uh, in order to do that, uh, locked cupboards. Right. You're, you're applying for a grant to help feed people. Right, right. But when you get to the budget, when you get to the method, you're going to say, we operate out of a church. We need to, to lock up these food cabinets. And your budget is going to show the budget for equipment to make that happen. But that's your method. Your method is creating that equipment. What you do, why you exist, is to help those folks. Right? You see, I think that's a really good point. We, we called it lock, locking in nutrition. Every 50 seconds. Exactly. <laughs> that would be good. Well, it's a huge <laughs> concept. You can dial so long. But it goes back to the problem yeah. of security. And that's not the problem. All right. Well, who hasn't got another title? They're helping me get a new kitchen. Yeah, oh, okay. What's the need state? Well, he's got one. Uh, guys, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, although there are three food pantries in the Hanover area, we are the only uh, soup kitchen. And we serve 120 people per day, one hot meal. We serve one hot meal a day to 120 people. Uh, we want to expand that to uh, breakfast every day, uh, along with the, uh, the, the uh, one hot meal every day. Why? Because the, the need in the Hanover area is, uh, uh, is growing beyond Tell us about the need. Don't tell us what you do. Tell us about the need. What is the need in the hamburger? Uh, Processing uh, need is a new riddle. The need yeah. is people <laughs> who are hungry and that need to be fed. Who are they? Right? That's the need. You have people who one meal a day is not enough. And you're going to demonstrate why they don't have access to hot meals anywhere else. <coughs> Why they don't have, you know, what is the situation? Maybe you're going to talk about unemployment. Maybe you're going to talk about chronic poverty cycles. Maybe you're going to talk about specific conditions to the Hanover community. You're going to put some data in that talks about this is how many people are out there. And this is how we know because we're only serving this many. Or we are finding out part of your need statement might be when we talk to our clients, they tell us they are living on one meal a day. So that's not enough. Not that you want to serve breakfast, it's that they're not getting it. You see the difference? Gotcha. You're building that case for the clients, and then your method is you're going to give them more food. You're going to get a new kitchen so you can cook in it. Who we forget? I think these folks back here. Our project is Project Enough, which is um, E N U F F, Every Neighbor United for Fitness. Ooh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> That was catchy. <laughs> Our need statement is the first need is for staff and equipment for a nutritional training facility 
at a community center in the Allison Hill neighborhood of Harrisburg. That's how you're going to do it. What's the problem? Nationwide, one in three adults are obese. In Allison Hill, that number is approaching one in two. We believe the driving force behind this increase is that 95% of the families in Allison Hill live below the poverty rate. Ooh. Read that again. That's Nationwide, one in three adults are obese. In Allison Hill, that number is approaching one in two. We believe the driving force behind this increase is because 95% of the families in Allison Hill live below the poverty level. Okay, so she's got some data and she's going to be able to support that. You're going to be able to tell us you got that one in two. And then you're going to go a little further and ask, what's the connection between living below the poverty level and lack of fitness opportunities? You see how they couch theirs in terms of they get the A. They couch their <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, we have, oh, you have more. <laughs> <laughs> um, poverty is linked to obesity because healthier foods are often more expensive than junk food. For example, milk, um, $2.99, pounded apples, that'll be over $5, versus a two liter of Coke, a dollar, and chips, another dollar, so under $2. Mm -hmm. If this need is addressed, we can reduce the number of people suffering from diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, and improve the overall health of families by improving their shopping and eating habits of future generations. Okay, very nice. Mm -hmm. What she's doing is painting a picture for me. Of what is the problem and how will my money help solve that problem? But be careful that you're not going to guarantee to me that you're going to get rid of diabetes in this population. Okay? Because you can't do that by yourself no matter how great your program is, right? And for all those neighborhood influences, so they need to talk about impacting the levels of diabetes that gets them. But the pain picture is telling the funder why your program is important. You would think the giant foods knows everything there is to know about hunger and poverty, but maybe not. Maybe they know everything about packing lettuce and you need to help them. So when you um, cite some type of number or that kind of thing, is it appropriate to use a footnote, or do you typically write something like according to the, the number of the organization you cite? You know what? I would try to avoid footnotes <coughs> unless it's a really long application, because you don't want to make the reviewer work harder than he has to, to find the information. Which reminds me that I have seen grant applications where they put a, a high, you know, here's our organization, here's the hyperlink to our website. Well, I'm sitting at my desk. I don't want to have to stop and go online to find out who you are. So if you want to take a screenshot of your great website and put that in the appendix so I can see it in paper, that's great. But don't be putting it, you know, don't, don't make me work. So in terms of footnotes and stuff, I think it's very important to have the citation. But that make, to find out where to put it. Ah, that just makes me think about so many grant applications. You know, they, they require that you do them online. Yes. You know, they are electronic. Mm -hmm. Does that change that at all? Then um, hyperlinks. Um, That's a good question. You know, I'm not because sure what the answer? Because because then I assume that they're well, I don't know if they're going to print them or whether they're reading online. But I know if you're reading it, it's a huge extra step, and you're making them do all this work. Like you're supposed to summarize that for them. Not say, go dig around our website. Yeah. Maybe you'll get interested. You know. I don't know. Yeah. That'll be a good question. I'll try and figure out. Or ask some people. Because more and more, that. like online only. Oh yes. And by the way, if you're doing online only, all that stuff about proofreading and keeping the oh, yeah. looking at stuff still applies. Sure. Because you're not putting anything up until you've got the complete application. Anybody here ever try to write one of those kinds of things online and then go back and find that you didn't have it all? Yeah. Not the clients and the needs. But the problems your organizations are experiencing can be part of the needs statement. We can't, we have more clients than we can serve. There's not enough food to serve all the clients who need our, 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 our clients aren't getting a, a nutritious breakfast. There are waiting lines for our services. There are waiting lists for our services. That kind of information, which is still really about the clients, right? They're not able to access your services because there's just not enough there. Can certainly go in the need state. Okay, did I forget anyone else? And now let me ask a question right? before you move yeah. from us. Yeah. When you look at a, at a two prong need, we we have the facility, we have the program, but to have the uh, volunteers <coughs> to keep it open and to run it. 
as well as to obtain either funding or additional donations to purchase them. Can both of those be addressed in the open need statement? Well, those are your organization's needs. That's what I was. Those aren't the clients. Because those are going to come up in your methods. You're going to say in your methods, here's the problem. The problem is these people need food, they need clothing, they need a bunch of stuff. And our method, the way we're going to address this need is by both increasing the number of volunteers and where the section one was. Does that make sense? Again, that's in your method piece. That's what you're going to do. We write a lot of the proposal backwards. You know, I've told you to, 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 to write the executive summary at the end, worry about your catch title at the end if you don't have a catch title in the beginning. But the need statement, that's the heart of your grant application. That's where you're telling me there's a problem that you want me to help solve with my money. So that need statement really does need to get written before you go into methods. And it's really hard not to jump right into methods. So bear that in mind. OK, now it's your turn. Okay. Um, Many of you guys may already know this, but I was thinking about it and I might as well mention it. Um, we do have a capacity building grant here at the food bank. Um, how many of you guys have heard of that before? Number of you? Okay, so a few. Um, it's, we have an endowment fund and a certain amount of that is put towards capacity building on the agency level every year. And so um, <coughs> Georgia Barton, who many of you know, my supervisor and AR is the person who is um, oversees the grant along with Joe Arthur, the executive director. But it's capacity building for things like refrigerators, freezers, um, material handling equipment such as conveyors, dollies, hand crafts, as well as other items to maintain and enhance feeding program efforts. So I heard a couple freezers and storage closets and things like that. And that might be something we would be able to help you with as well. So I just wanted to make sure you were aware of it. Um, if you want a whole huge walk-in freezer, we can't most of the time we can't put the funds towards an entire purchase of a, a walk-in freezer, but it might be an opportunity to ask for at least a couple thousand, maybe, get that, and then you can find the rest of the grant elsewhere. So if you guys are interested, I have a couple, and you can, at the end of the workshop, come see me, and I'll pass those out. I only have like 10 or so, but I can get more. Um, but that's another good good opportunity, so I wanted to share that. Great, thank you. Oh, and one other thing. Um, I was looking at the things we need, and we need a program description, a statement of need, equipment specifications, and vendor quotes. So it's a lot of the things we were looking at today. The vendor quotes, I think, is the thing that people tend to forget mm -hmm. to put in the grant application, and they even forget to ask sometimes for a specific amount of money. They just say, I want a this. But really, we're giving you the money to get something, so think about that, too, when you apply. Great. Okay. That brings up another question, and thank you. Uh, would it be, in, in our case, where we, we want uh, a certain piece of equipment, would it be better to go to a vendor and say, this is what I need, how about, uh, uh, can, can you provide it for us? Well, that's certainly one way to go about it. Mm -hmm. Or, we, we, would, we know you can't, you know, if you can't give us the whole thing, can you match? If we can come up with 50% of the cost, will you match that? Or will you give it to us at a reduced rate? Will you give us 20% off the price? And if he says yes, and we'll get to that in the budget and the in-kind, there's a, there's a donation that you can write right into your grant application that you're asking me to fund 80% of the freezer because the vendor has already agreed to put it in his 20%. So yes, that whole leveraging thing. Okay, because we're going to get into budget real quick here. Um, okay, so designing the project, you describe the needs, what are you going to do about it? Sometimes, funders like to see, and this is not always a requirement, in your world it's probably less a requirement than it would be if you were doing something totally new and innovative, but a lot of times you're asked, is this replicable? If you're going to try project enough, if you're going to try a new way of introducing health and fitness activities for a, a low-income community, and it works. Will other communities be able to pick up what you're doing and do it there? That's not always a requirement, but if they ask about replicability, that's what they're asking about. And if they are, and this is truthfully something that someone else could do, if you design the model for it, can someone else do it? That can get you some extra points. 
and are you unique is something else some funders just year after year invest in the community and in, in the important programs we need but some foundations say we don't want to just keep throwing money at the problem you know we want to come up with the silver bullet the solution we all know they can't do that but that's what they're asking you to do. So is there a way to position yourself so that you are a little different? Is there a new twist on the project? This is not always the case. Some funders are looking for a proven, traditional approach to a problem. So you have to look at who, that's that part about doing that homework with the funder. If you're looking at something like the Foundation for Enhancing Communities with regional foundations, they may not care at all about uniqueness or innovation. They just want to find responsible organizations in the community to do their good work. Okay. So then, in the project description, the goals are what is it that you want to achieve in your objectives or your specific plan of action. Now, I will tell you that um, don't get hung up on goal and objective language. We always teach that the goal is the overarching thing you want to do. You want to reduce the level of hunger in your community, and the objective is your specific act action plan we want to provide hot lunches for 150 people every day of the year um, there are other people who use the goal as a smart goal and make it measurable it's just semantics in some fashion you want to get to both what it is you want to achieve and how you're going to achieve it we, we like to in extension split that out with goal objective method is how are you going to do it and obviously before you apply for this grant you need to have thought through what is it you're going to do and what's it going to take because how do you know what you're applying for if you're applying for a specific piece of equipment or a freezer or, or, or some lot storage, it's a little easier. But if you're talking about now adding breakfast to your services, what's that going to involve? You know, how much food is that going to take? What other equipment are you going to need? How many other people are you going to need? All of those things need to be thought about. Staff and administration, who's going to do it? We're going to spend a little time on evaluation and how you know that you did what you said you were going to do. And this one's really key. If I give you $10,000 this year, how are you going to do the program next year? Because I'm not willing to commit to $10,000 every year. So how is my $10,000 going to make your program sustainable? And some of you use that term, sustainability, after my money has dried up. So that's often a really key question for funders. And you will say, in just about those words, how will this program continue at the end? And the answer is not, we're going to go find another grant. <laughs> I mean, you might be able to get away with that, but most funders aren't going to buy that as the answer. So you really need to think about, are you going to develop um, organizational capacity for, are you going to focus more on development? Maybe the answer is, we're going to devote 20% of our administrative staff time to grant seeking fundraising because that's who you are. But you need to think about a legitimate answer to that question, not just we're going to go find another grant. You might say, we will pursue other funding opportunities from similar foundations, or we will explore an opportunity with a larger grant opportunity, or with the state, or with whomever. But it needs to have some basis in reality. Um, how do they feel about um mentioning events and event planning and opportunities out within your community that may be raising money for you over time. Like if you have an annual event or you have something that brings some level of funding to your organization on a regular basis, or maybe you're going to start a new one, or is that something that I'd sure want to hear, funding? I sure want to hear about that because that tells me you're a stable organization that okay. has other resources besides the money that I'm going to give you. I had the Department of Health mini grant come across my email and it was very time sensitive. I only had about a month to do it, but I really, really wanted um, accessible gardening tables. And I went big and dreamed and I want eight of them and I wanted trellises on them so that whatever things we were going to grow could climb the trellises. Um, the, the objective of their grant had to involve <coughs> improving nutrition and sodium reduction. So they wanted, 
activity. So I put it there that, you know, gardening, we are making this a safe activity, reducing the fall risk. We're going to improve the nutrition because they're going to grow these things. And to make it sustainable, we sold the produce at below market cost and the money that was raised by selling the produce went into a seed fund for starter plants and seeds for the next year. So cool. I was able to meet all of their... Did you get it? Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah. That's a great yeah. idea. And, and you see what happened? What Kelly really did here was she, and congratulations, but she also identified the, the money that I that they need from the Department of Health was for the big pieces, the accessible gardening tables. But what you really did is you identified what are our ongoing costs, right? What's it going to cost next year? Well, we're going to need more soil. We're going to need more whatever. Okay, and we'll come back to that. Let's go on and look at these. Okay, evaluation. Why did I skip all the way down the list to evaluation? Because when you're developing your methods and your goals, and your objectives for the project, you need to be thinking about how will you know if you did a good job. And some of you are sitting there thinking, well, duh, if I can feed 50 people, I've accomplished my mission. In some cases, it's not quite as clear cut. With Project Enough, how would you measure what you've done? So you need to think about um, how will you demonstrate to the funder that you have begun to meet the need or work on the problem. So if, you're, if your project is just about handing food to people, that's a relatively easy thing to evaluate. You can count the number of grocery bags that you give out, or the hot meals that you serve, or those kinds of things. If your project is about helping people by giving them food and clothing and getting them to move out of their current situation, then your evaluation's a little, a little trickier, because then you need to kind of track people and see what happens to them. And do they, do they get an opportunity to move up out of what you were doing, it, if that's your program, I'm making it up as I go. Um, or project enough. Are they, are people seeing improvements in their health? Are they adopting more uh, fitness into their lifestyles? Is there some way you can evaluate how much time people are spending on fitness or what kinds of activities they're doing? You can't do the lab work, you can't take the blood sugar, right, to prove that their, their health is improving, but you can show changes in lifestyle if that's what you're trying to do. So you need to think about those things, and um, what you're really doing is, once again, you're reinforcing to the funder that we're going to spend this money in a way that has results that we're going to be able to share with you. You're going to be able to go back to your shareholders, your investors, your donors, whoever's putting, your family, whoever's putting the money into this and say, you know what, the $20,000 that you spent with the Hungry People Organization actually helped this many people with healthy meals this year. You can do things like surveys, you can do interviews, you can actually count, you can count people, you can count food, you can count equipment, you can, but you're trying to tell what did you do with the money you received and so what, okay? So you fed 120 people three meals a week, so what? Does that enable them to live, to improve the quality of their life, to enable them to maintain better health? What happens as a result? If you can, we're not solving the problems of the world, but to the extent that you can demonstrate the impact of what you did, right? That's going to help the finder understand. Um, there are a couple of different ways that, that we can measure and indicate things, and this is a topic of a whole other workshop, so we'll, we'll do this real briefly, but we just want to show that Behavioral is things that happen within people. So the example there, the terrible of that is, okay, kids, you have a swimming program. Kids learn how to swim, okay? That's behavioral. You can say the kids came to the class and they learned how to swim. You talk about their performance. How do you know they learned how to swim? Because they passed a test. And by the way, it was by a certified Red Cross lifeguard, and we can show you. We can document what they did. The behavioral is fine if that's as far as you can go, but if you can Show it, that's even better. Process. We're going to figure out what was the best way to teach them. We're going to figure out, we do hot meals, we do nutrition education, we do fitness. We're going to figure out which ones of those are effective. And then we're going to write a manual about it. Or we're going to create a, a, a program that's replicable. Or we're going to do something. Not every 
project has to meet all of these indicators, but these are ways that you measure what you're doing. These are ways that you evaluate what you do. So if you're stuck at just counting, counting the number of people and the number of groceries, see if you can come up with some of these other kinds of indicators that talk about what you're doing. Because in the world of applying for funding, what you're really saying is not only did we feed all those people, but we're helping to solve the problem. We're meeting the need, and this is how we know. Does that make sense? I, I don't know if you're going to talk about reporting, but sometimes if you're getting a $1,000 grant and you look at the reporting they want from you, you might decide that there's more reporting than the thousand dollars. Yep. Yep. Yeah. We'll look at that. I've seen some heads <laughs> nod around. That could be a real problem. We're going to get to that. Oh, right. Okay. Right. So no, I'm glad right. you said that. It's, so it's not let's go on. Okay. Staffing. Two kinds of staffing. Who's going to manage the grant itself, which is part of the reporting, and who's going to do the work? Okay. And it's not always the same people. Sometimes it is. But if I'm giving you money, who is going to take the money? How are they going to keep the money? Who's going to do the reporting? If I need forms signed off on, who's going to sign off on those forms? Who's going to send me the grant clip? Whatever. Um, in your world, sometimes you just get a grant and somebody writes you a check and you're done. But um, probably you have to do some reporting back. Mm -hmm. To the extent that you can say, we have the capacity within our organization to do that. And it's this person who has handled grants before successfully. That really is a very strong statement to be able to say. We have received as many grants in the past and been successful in administering all of them, which simply means that you didn't blow the money and nobody came put you in jail. But um, <laughs> or you didn't, or you didn't return money you didn't spend. Yeah, I know that's big no-no. Um, but uh, showing that you have that capacity, and if you don't, if this is the first time you're getting a grant, talk about the fact that you have somebody who's going to administer this grant, and this person has some office background or some you know, paper shuffling background or some managerial capacity or something like that. Something convinces me that somebody's going to take care of this money. Um, and then you need to talk about who's going to be running the project and, and how you're going to do it, who you're going to use, who you use staff, volunteers, whatever. And, oh, and who's going to do your evaluation? If you're going to actually do more, well, at any point in your evaluation, if you're going to be keeping track of meals served, or if you're going to be measuring people's behavior, or if you're going to be doing interviews or whatever, who's the person who's going to be doing that? And it could be one person is fulfilling all of these functions, but you need to address all of those, because it's wonderful to tell me that you're going to do in-depth interviews with 20% with of the clients in your organization, but show me that you've got the capacity to handle that that you've got somebody who actually can do that, or that you're going to recruit college students and they're going to get college credit for working on this resource for you. Um, but find a way to explain it to me so I know before I give you money, you're going to be able to spend it well. That's what the staffing piece is about. OK, enough said about staffing. Budget. Oh, this one is so hard. Uh, somebody, I think what Steve was asking before about, should you ask for a whole lot and, 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 and be happy if you get less? Well, yeah, sure, but make sure that what you're asking for, that you can support everything. Um, how else will you pay for project costs? Are you going to get a match from somebody else? Is somebody going to contribute? Are you going to have volunteer hours involved in this? Is a match required? Now, one word about matches. Different funders use the term 50-50 match in different ways. It's not always a question of just taking that top number and dividing it in two and you pay half and I pay half. Sometimes they do some really weird things with that. Like, I can't even do the formulas, but they do some strange things with, with that. So make sure when it's a matching grant that you understand how they calculate the match. And that might even be part of the discussion you're having with the funder. We're applying for $100,000 and it's a 50% match. Does that mean that we need to come up with $50,000? get them to do the math in front of Just a little word of caution. And then real dollars are in-kind services. Let's look at the next slide on in-kind services, OK? In-kind is something that you don't have to pay for that has value. So it might be people, might be equipment, might be use of a shared kitchen, might be um, professional services. 
but check with the funder because the funder may have a description. The funder may say, uh, in-kind services does not include volunteers. And then you can include volunteers. Or they may say, in-kind services includes volunteers at minimum wage. And then you've got to figure out how many hours your volunteers are going to be volunteering and what's minimum wage. I have a question. Let's say you have a project that's going to cost 30000 And I know that potentially Walmart, Target, and PNC could fund it. Can I give the same proposal to all three? and hope to get the 30000 Or should I just pursue one funding source and then wait to get a decision before I take that same proposal to another funding source? What do you guys think? It is a good question. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I agree. How many people think all three? How many people think one and wait? I don't know that there's a right or wrong answer yeah, to that. I, that. I think it kind of depends on the project. And I guess the real question is, is it that discrete a project, like the project for the, the, the food storage or the project for the kitchen, is it that discrete a project so that if you got two of them, you wouldn't be able to spend the second one? Or do you have the opportunity to expand that and do even more with it? Yeah, I, I know. it's uh, The temptation is really there to go out and, and and hit numerous people at the same time, particularly if, if there are funding cycles. So if you don't do it this year, you have to wait a whole year before you can go back if you didn't get the other grant. So I think just make sure that if if, if you have an embarrassment of riches, you know, and everybody gets you spend money, it. spend yeah. it. Yeah. You have to return it. And so, I mean, say if you applied to all three and then received one when the other two are still like in the process of being evaluated, you could withdraw your application, right? Mm. You could withdraw your application. You could also go back to that funder and say, we were fortunate enough to find this money somewhere else. And I'm going, ooh, this is a really, this is a, a viable organization. They already got somebody else to fund this. But we have another thing we'd like to talk to you about. Because it really puts you in a position of strength when you've gotten that grant. Does that help? Yes, it does. OK, so good, good. OK. Um, when you're doing when you're doing your budget narrative, again, the funder may or may not give you a form to use or an outline for the budget. And if the funder gives you a form, use the form. Okay. But if you don't get a form, create your own budget, and you want to be as specific as you can. If your personnel costs are eight thousand dollars, you need to tell me what that is. We have a brand administrator who this much of her time at this cost, we have a project implementation person. You know, you need to tell me the hours and the rates if you want me to pay for people. And if there's benefits involved, you need to tell me that too. If it's for equipment, you need to tell me the walk-in freezer we have had quoted at X number of dollars. Okay? And as, as often as you can, if you can use worksheets to show people, or you can charge mileage for this project, well, how did you get to your mileage figure? All those things you did on the back of your, your scratch pad, put those into an Excel spreadsheet or some other kind of mechanism and show the funder that you have actually thought through and you know what all these things are going to cost. This is a budget. It's not a signed legal agreement that says you will spend the money in exactly that way. It's an indication that you have planned this out carefully. Okay? And explain your future funding plan. And oh, by the way, Depending on the foundation or the funder, especially if you're going for larger dollars, if they're looking for in-kind, you can often use things like your administrative overhead. Like we're housed in a church, so we don't have to pay rent. So the value of that space to us is the church's contribution to our project. So always be thinking about what you already have in terms of can you show that as someone else's contribution to what you're doing. If you've already got a lunch program in place and you want to add breakfast, how much of that lunch program can you show as in kind to your organization? This is what we all very, very rely on. And I think the question about do we have other events and other resources, it shows that you're viable. One more page on budgets. Um, make sure that the budget um, the funder really understands that the funder gives you budget categories, use them, write a budget narrative. 
just, you know, a couple of paragraphs that, that explain in, in sentences what your numbers say. By the way, that's something we always tell local governments, too. When you're putting your budget out for the taxpayers, don't just give them the numbers, write a story, tell them what it is, write a story for your budget here, and describe your in-kind contribution. But the next slide goes to the question I had before, make sure that you understand what you're getting into, too. These are not common occurrences, particularly for small grants, but sometimes they happen. Sometimes people want their funds in a separate checking account, and that can cost you money. Okay? So be aware of that. Some, not usually private foundations, this is usually more public, but sometimes you're required to get an audit of the grant funds at the end. Of, at the end. And if you do, if you are required, they'll say that right up front. But if that's true, and you can't pay for that out of the grant, that might cost you another couple thousand dollars. So think about that. This one is much less frequent traveling for meetings with the funder. It's much more um, typical if you're getting uh, federal funding or, or some kinds of state funding where they'll require you to go to meetings to learn how to administer the funds or those kinds of things. Department of Health might occasionally ask people to come up and, and do that. And if that's going to cost you money and your organization is worried about mileage, you need to think about that. This one's real important. Are you going to get the, how do you get the money? Do they, if they, if you apply for the $30,000 for a year's worth of programming and they give you the grant, are they giving you a check for $30,000 January 1? Or are they giving you a check for $30,000 December 31 after you've implemented the program for a year and now they're going to reimburse? Or are they going to reimburse you once a quarter, every quarter? And you need to understand that up front. Because if you don't get the money until after you've incurred the cost, how do you pay up front? If you buy the freezer and then they pay you for it, where's the cash come for the freezer while you're waiting? So make sure you are aware of these things. And I can't tell you enough. If you don't know, ask the funder. Get on the phone and say, we just want to make sure we understand that. If you have a funder who's talking to you, like that Foundation for Enhancing Communities that said that step two is called a funder. If you have someone who's working with you on a project, they don't mind those kinds of questions within reason. Don't bug them every day. Because they now have confidence that you are a responsible organization that is really thinking through not just what your clients need, but how you manage the money. So that one's important. Get a chance to tell them as much as you can about your organization, who's in charge, how it's run, what's the history of it, what are some of the other wonderful things that you do, what's your relationship to the community, what have been your successes, why are you wonderful? Okay. You may, if it's a relatively local foundation, want to list who's on your board of directors, your steering committee, or whoever operates you. Um, because it may be names that people recognize. If you're going to target a corporation, they may not really care who's on your board of directors, but think about those connections and can you build those connections. Um, next slide. If you are allowed or if you're, if you're required to have an appendix, they're going to tell you exactly what they want to see. If you're allowed to have an appendix, which is often just called supporting materials, here's your chance to tell your story. Here's all the pieces. So, Great articles in the newspaper, letters of appreciation, testimonials from clients. You know, you helped me in my time of need, and now I'm happy to tell you I've got a job, I'm on my feet, life is going well, mm -hmm. you know, I'm really working. If you have that kind of stuff, use that kind of stuff. Um, letters of support from other organizations are often required, and even if they're not, it's a great idea to get those. So you might go to the Central PA Food Bank and say, can you write a letter of support for our grant application? And then the Central PA Food Bank, which is a known organization, will say, yeah, we think this is a good project and we think you should consider funding it. A lot of people create a blank letter of support and they send it out to everybody and people put on their own letterhead and sign it and send it back. That's okay. Everyone knows that happens. If you can get the people who write your letters of support to write them in their own words, that is way more powerful. Mm -hmm. Depending on what kind of organization you're applying to, if you can get some political support, your local, uh, you know, your county commissioner or your state legislator might be willing to write a letter of support for you to say that they also are putting a stamp of approval on this. 
Your county may be real interested in doing that if you're helping meet human services needs in the county that are otherwise to fall back on the county. So if you can get maybe your county uh, human services director or county administrator or a commissioner to write a, a letter of support. Um, those of you who are in faith-based organizations, getting your church council to write that letter of support. Other community organizations. Do you partner with anybody? Do you have a relationship with United Way or um, you know, Healthy Communities Partnership or something like that? Think about those folks as folks who can help you by supporting what you want, <coughs> want to do. Um, oh, back up one minute. Uh, newsletters, annual reports, that kind of thing. I just saw for the first time the Central PA Food Bank newsletter. What a great, what a great publication that is. And if you're in it, Put that in your grant application, okay? Just add that in. Yes. Yeah. The letter of support, does that have to be written specifically to the particular um, grant that you're applying for, or can these be um, general letter of support they that should, you can then use for multiple? They should be specific. They should be specific to that particular project that you're applying for. but. Sometimes you can just get them direct to, to be addressed back to you. Dear Dwight, here's my letter of support for the grant you're applying for. for. Okay? So it doesn't have to be addressed to the funding organization that you're sending to. But it can come back to you. But when you come to me and say, will I support your application, you, you want to tell me, who are, you, who are you applying to? How much money do you want? That little cover letter piece? You know, that one paragraph, this is what we're doing. And usually, you're asking your friends, or your friends in the larger community sense, for these letters of support. They're people who are already on your side. So you can give them talking points. Just give them a couple of bullets. These are the reasons why this is important. If you can incorporate some of this language in your letter, so much the better. You've got experience with this, I can tell? Oh, yes, it's so helpful. Yeah. What kinds of people do you get letters of support from? Well, people that we know, uh, you know, who have been, you know, know what we're doing, and they have a passion for what they're doing, and they're people of, of you know, of authority and validity, you know, in the community, and so, you know, it's it, they're influential, yeah. and so it's very helpful. Yeah, they're giving you their good housekeeping seal of approval, exactly, and they're showing that you have broad-based community support, so that's a great thing to do. Um, I forget where I am with this. So let's go ahead and see those. Oh, before we get to the grant review, but we, we can leave it there. Before we get to that, um, I was on the net just the other day looking at a grant stream for sustainable farming. Don't ask me why. And this guy had an interesting blog up there. He's on the side that usually is giving the grants, and he'd apply to a grant for, for a grant to somebody else. He said it was very interesting to try and switch, switch sides. He said, I thought this was interesting. Writing grant proposals means setting ourselves up for rejection because only a fraction of the great ideas people have can be funded. So he doesn't get his grant. He says, my first reaction was not an example of good sportsmanship. What a bunch of idiots, I thought. Those reviewers did not give good enough reasons for my rejection. They missed the point and they picked up details. But with the passage of time, I saw things a little differently. Maybe I hadn't made my case so clearly after all. The reviewer questions suggested they didn't understand the issues I knew so well. Perhaps I had some responsibility for that. After all, writing grants is like being a salesperson. You've got to clearly explain, explain to the reader the need for the product. That's our need statement. Mm -hmm. How and why it will work and address any doubts they may have. I was blinded by enthusiasm, so I hadn't read my words from a skeptic's point of view. I still think my project was good enough to fund, but the reality is that reviewers had a lot to choose from and decided others were better. So I'll take my timeline, letters of support, and unfulfilled outcomes and go home. Or I can dust off my proposal and my pride for another try. <laughs> okay, the grant review process, particularly in foundations, there's usually multiple levels of review. There's usually somebody who goes through the front and just makes sure that yeah, you actually are an eligible organization. You didn't apply for a grant that is restricted to people who live in Pittsburgh, okay? Um, and that you're a good fit. They have some certain criteria that they use to make sure that you're, 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 you're applicable. And then they usually have a review committee come in. Has anyone here ever served on a grant review committee? For what kinds of grants? It was years ago for 
Pennsylvania Coalition Against Domestic Violence okay. and the state organization funded all the, the locals so the grants would, applications would come in every year. And did you review those by yourself or in a Oh committee? no, it was a large committee. Okay. okay. I was involved in an arts organization where we were each asked to review one grant application that came in and meet with the artist and help that artist explain what it was they wanted to do. So it was almost like an application reinforcement process. And it was very interesting because I guess the history of the organization was that artists are great people, but they're not real good at writing grants. So. Um, but the reviewer may not know, I sure didn't know anything about arts except, that, you know, I know it when I see it, I like it. But. So they may not know your role, or they may have expertise in it. Typically they are scoring projects, and these are the pieces that are usually weighted the highest. So um, this is a fake proposal evaluation sheet that I made up. Um, but it gives you an idea of the kinds of ways um, the kinds of ways that people look at grants. This one ranks on seven different things, and they're weighted so that a grant that receives the highest point in all of these would get 100, 100 points. Okay? So they're looking at the needs statement, the goals and objectives, the methodology, the outcomes and the deliverables, what do we get out of this project, the evaluation, the budget, and partnerships and support, and each one of those would get certain points. This is often how projects are rated. And somebody reviews these, a committee reviews these, and then they just go down. And they, they start giving out the money from the highest score down until they run out of money. Or they have a cutoff point there. It's not always this cut and dry, but often this is the situation in grants review. So, and you can see that they have a whole series of questions. These may or may not be things that were reflected on the grant application. If you're lucky, these questions match up with the things you were asked to do. So Sarah, let's take a look at this. Oh, we're going to make you guys work again. Um, <laughs> For, and this is a made-up grant that we had a couple of years ago and I, 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 for another workshop and I found it and I liked it because it's about um, the Deer and Elk Farmers Association. But I bet nobody in this room has any idea what Deer and Elk Farmers are like. I certainly don't. But this is, this is a made-up application from them. And you're on a grant review committee. There are 45 applications to review. Okay. So you've only got 15 minutes for each application that you're going to review, which makes it a tougher call, okay? So what, I want, what I've got here is copies of the application. It's eight pages, but it's big type, okay? And some of it's supporting material. Don't get scared, okay? So what I want you to do is get into groups of four for this one. If you need to move around, do so. And then I want you to, in 15 minutes, figure out how you would score this and actually put a score and see if your committee can come to agreement on a score for this grant. And we'll see how this grant application did when we come back together. Now, if I were on a committee of four and I had to review 45 grants in 15 minute intervals, we might all read it really fast and then try and talk about it. We might divvy up. We might say, you look at the budget, you look at the supporting information, you look at whatever. Or we might, there, there are several ways to slice it. So there is no right way to do it. But what we want you to do is just get into the other side of this equation for a minute and see how you feel about it. How many of you got a new appreciation for the other side? The pressure is not all on your side, right? The pressure to give out the money and figure out if people are worthwhile applicants, even if they can't type it. Um, is really tough. Did anyone actually get to the point of coming up with a number? Numerical score for this? Mm -hmm. Well, I thought it was Yes. Scores over here? I think it was 30. A total? Total? I, I believe we, when I totaled it, it came out with 30. 30? 30? After my brain cells were done committing suicide, I <laughs> uh, after reading everything, it's uh, 
we came around, most of us came around about anywhere from 28 to 36, 37. I came 37. Oh, 37. Still a failing grade. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 80, 20, 8 and a 2. 8 and a 2. 8 and a 2. 0. You guys didn't like that. <laughs> wow. That's worse. Totally against the dealer's uh, See, I'm the Confused on who they are as an individual because the executive director is not the same beneficiary that's getting the money. So it's there. There it's like who is I getting? I couldn't figure out who Sky was. I, yeah, I was like, what happened to Sky? Yeah, yeah. where's Sky? Sky? I'm concerned. We got Lauren, and Sky, and Mark, and, and then Quinn just, in the middle of the application. Yeah. <laughs> who were the letters of support from? Uh, Collaborating themselves. Right? Yeah. 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 I, I, I thought if you really read through it, you could come up with what the need was. If you could, if you would just have to, you know, you right. could, yeah, it was like but the it was roughest, scattered. Right. It, was it was the scattered. roughest of drafts. I there was no goals and objectives to speak of. Once well, you okay. get, they, they needed to, to improve the viability of the deer and farming industry. Okay, I got that. That was right. more like a, lob a right. lobbying rather than, this is a non-process. It really isn't clear, is it? Whether it was or not. I mean, I Probably understand not. that a lot of groups have lobbyists who are an association of dairy farmers, for example, and they promote good agendas. But I wasn't sure in this, other yeah. than just hiring. Imagine that, imagine that you're on a review committee for an agriculturally based community that is inclined to support farming. Mm -hmm. You still have problems with this. Right. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, one of the other things was um, the process you were talking about using an executive director to oversee and your head the current as well as future projects. Do they know for the which is which? Like, what are they adding on and what are we going to see the projects that you do? She was going to write more proposals. That was the only thing I could find. There's, There's no evaluation data point. in here whatsoever. There's right. no way that we will know if the executive director actually accomplished anything. What do you think about the budget? 
Yeah, it looked like there was only one person. What should they have put? What else could have been in the budget that would have helped you to see what they were actually going to do or where your money was going to go? Marketing. 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 A breakdown of the duties. Transfer. Uh, breakdown of the education. duties. Yeah. A job description for the executive director might have been helpful, right? Specific tasks that would be accomplished. And how are they going to fund this after this person? Is yeah. this person staying? Are they yeah. going to fund it after? on their own, out of their own budget in the next year? And that their support data actually adds up? Yeah. Total. Yeah, they came up, they gave you some hours. Right. They didn't tell you how they got to those hours. Right. What are they going to spend those hours doing? And that's where when we were talking about the budget worksheets that you're going to use to support the budget, Mine. saying executive director needs to spend this much time every month on newsletters, this much time every month on marketing, this much time every month on visiting farmers, whatever, and add that up so we can say, oh, that's how they got to that number of hours for a year's worth of work. And at the same time, it's telling you what that guy's going to do. Is it ever wise to include like a miscellaneous portion in the budget, like for unforeseen expenses, or should we just? I, I think it's okay to do that if you're pretty clear about what kinds of unforeseen things you're going to have, which is a little tricky to do. Because you don't know what they are. I'll know it when I see it. Right? But it's, it needs to be, the, the question is about miscellaneous expenses and our um, uh, contingency. So I'll express the contingency fund. You can do that. It needs to be a small amount. It's often limited. You can only use 5% for contingency if you have that kind of a strict application. But if you can give some examples of the kinds of things that you might have. There might be escalation in fuel costs or food costs or we may have um, higher staff or, or something. If you, can, if you can sort of explain the kinds of things you're concerned about, that will help. But you don't have to. Anybody have experience with that or talk about that? Just in that little um, gardening grant, um, I didn't know a lot about contingencies, but when we actually bought our soil to fill the beds, it came in under budget, but one of the things I hadn't planned for were pavers for underneath the legs of all the tables and so they don't the leveling yeah. and the yeah. sinking, and we were able to <coughs> take the the money we saved in soil, put it to the pavers, but I did need to talk to the grant officer about it, and she was like, oh, that's no problem, that fits in to contingencies, and... And you can shift line items. Right. Yeah, yeah, so you might have that once you've got, and we're not talking at all about how to administer the grant actually after you get it, but that might be one of the things. You might want to clarify that um, adding more staff is not a contingency item. If you think that this is something that, if you think the funder is not interested in funding the positions particularly, so you might say um, unanticipated uh, increases in the cost of materials and supplies, for instance, or a greater demand for your services, something like that. And you need to be careful with it, but you can do it. I think to a certain extent, acknowledging that there are things that might happen that we can't anticipate is one of those indicators of responsible administration. Mm -hmm. Okay, well this was almost a cartoon exercise in terms of grant review, but when you think about sitting on a committee that's getting those 45 or those 100 or those 25 applications, there are going to be different levels. There are going to be applications that rise to the top right away. And um, I've sat on RFP committees like Ross has done where you read through the proposals and we just say, um, are there any that we all agree don't even merit our discussion as a committee? You just take those off the table. So you really, and that's where this one would probably end up. And you really don't want to be in that situation. You want to be in that top number of proposals that they say these, these are worth discussing because they have a lot of merit and we want to look at them. And that's why building that proposal carefully is so strong. And if we show you anything at all today, it's that there's no science to this. You know, it's, there's not a specific way to do it. 
but the more that you can tell your story and position yourself as saying to the funder, we're going to help you put your money to the use you want to use it for, the stronger your application can be. Because remember that as a reviewer, your job, I should have put that in this exercise, you have to spend this much money on year and out somewhere this year, you know. Your job is to give away that money. Okay, so let's wrap up here with just a couple more thoughts. So, your dear and elf, just driving me crazy here. Your dear and elf, yeah. the puzzle got accepted. The very first thing you do is thank your funder, thank all those people who wrote you support letters, all those people who helped you put this grant together in any way. You do the thanking up, and then thanking up, and then you set up the reporting systems right away. And I think Kelly will attest that the Department of Health probably had some pretty strict requirements about what they want to get, how often they want to get those reports. Somebody asked earlier about, in my video, about um, grants that have excessive reporting requirements. And when I was in local government, we used to get these pictures from the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission that we stopped applying for because the reporting requirements took more time than the value of the grant. It just wasn't worth it for a small amount of money. And, and, and you know, what's, as a follow-up to what you said about the reporting requirements, because they can be expensive, and I know being in state government, working in the whole arena of procurement, they would have to be inserted into the bid language and into your yeah. RFP yep. because we were mandated by law. We always had to reference, you know, sections that apply to grants, dollar amounts, and of course all those reporting requirements had to go, had to be inserted because we were mandated by the law to do so. Right. And we as the state agency, we were audited by the Auditor General's office. So and you know, to be responsible. Yeah. And you know what? The taxpayers don't care if she's spending a thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars or a hundred million dollars. They want to know that she's being responsible for it. So guess what? Yeah. That's us that, that, that they're holding mm -hmm. accountable. Reporting systems go through the grant requirements again. If you just get a letter from the funder saying congratulations for giving you the money, you set up your own. But it's a good time to call the funder again and say thanks. Now, let me make sure I have all the pieces in place so that you'll get what you need at the end of this grant. Make sure everyone's clear on the expectations. This one's important. Just because you got the letter saying you got the grant does not necessarily mean you're allowed to start yet. So find out when the starting date is for the activities. And think about a public announcement. I think it was Dwight earlier was talking, maybe it was, um, you sort of was talking about, do you want to publicize this company on public goods or whatever? So that's what you do. Or you didn't get funded. The very first thing you do is exactly the same. Make sure you thank the funder. Thanks for spending the time looking at my sorry but proposal. <laughs> <laughs> and your network of supporters, everybody who wrote you a letter. Thanks very much. This moves us along. We didn't get this grant, but this moves us one step closer to uh, achieving our goal because we're going to go back out and shop the same project as on the other. Whatever. Contact the funder and ask why you didn't get the grant. If it's a big grant, you will maybe get review comments from it. But if you don't, call up and ask why, and you may be very surprised. I went to the Foundation for Enhancing Communities several years ago when it was still whatever it was called before that, Greater Harrisburg Foundation or something, for a grant for a project in our local library in the state. And I worked with the project person at the, at the foundation, you know, talked with her on the phone a couple of times, wrote the proposal up, it was on a couple pages, thought it was pretty strong, and we didn't get the money, and I called up and said, how can we make this stronger in the future? And she said, we loved this project. We didn't have enough money this year. Please bring it back in next year. If I had not made that call, I would have no idea that that was the situation. And they did fund it the next year. So, you know, those kinds of things happen. But do, contact them and say, how can I make this a stronger proposal? Because even if you're not going to go back to that funder, you can get some really valuable input on what to do to make it a better proposal. You know, I just didn't quite understand the connection 
between weekly grocery bags and physical goods yeah, as a reviewer. So help me understand how to do that. Um, and that, that's the kind of feedback you really need. Um, ask about other organizations. Maybe that funder just didn't feel you were a good fit for the organization. Very nice project, but not really where the Judy Chambers Foundation is interested in, in putting its money. Well, thank you. Do you have any suggestions for other foundations that might be interested in this kind of a project? And maintain that relationship, because you're going to want to go back sometime in the future to these folks. So whether you get it or not, you need to do the homework there. And, and make sure. Yeah. Whether you get it or not, you should be gracious. Yeah, <coughs> absolutely. Because there's always next year or the next cycle. Mm -hmm. There is always next year. I think one of the hardest things <coughs> for us to do is to help our own organizations understand when we don't have success. So um, we need we need to learn how to spin a grant rejection. For all the people on the board of directors or in our committee <coughs> or volunteers or whoever it was who were really working with us, because sometimes these are big efforts, to understand that, first of all, to have the expectation that you don't bat a thousand in, in, in the world of grants to begin with, like the guy said in the, the thing I read, you know, we're, we're setting ourselves up for rejection. But to find ways to recognize the work that was done and find the value in that grant proposal or grant application so that you can go back out the next time and use it again. You know? And maybe you don't get the money, but you maybe you made some real you did some really good thinking about the organization. You kind of got organized around the project or defined it better or, or figured out what you really wanted to do or looked at the future in a way you hadn't looked at it before. You really need to build up the expectations in advance that this is a 50-50 proposition, and afterwards, that, that, that failing to get a grant is not a failure. Is there like a success thing that you look for, oh, we should try to get, is there a percentage, you know, oh? Yeah, if you ask my employer, he'll say, the Penn State University, they'll say, yeah, we expect you to bring in this project. <laughs> 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 well, a percentage of, of like, oh, um, ha, 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 how much success should you expect from, uh, you know, oh, 10 grants, I mean, I don't know. It's I don't such a know. rule of thumb. Or, you know. I don't know. Professional grants writers probably do have that kind of thinking. You know, um, I just thought they probably and do. I don't, really I don't know. know. Yeah. I, I was saying to somebody over break that, that I've also been <coughs> pretty hard to create grant opportunities for myself in, in Penn State Extension. Those are pretty easy for my colleagues who are working with dairy cattle, or they're working with food educators, or they're working with fitness and you know health and nutrition programs or food safety. But you know, I've really struggled with how do I go out and find grants that help me do community capacity building stuff like this? Am I gonna find a funder who says, yeah, we'll pay you to go out and talk to people in the community and tell them how to do grants? Well, probably, but I haven't really put the hard work into that myself to try and figure out where is that connection. Where's the hook? But you know, maybe working with the Central Pennsylvania Food Bank is the kind of thing. You know, should we be focusing the work we're doing in community development and extension around specific populations? And can that help us? But there you go, right back to setting your mission. If I do that and I don't pay attention to another part of the community, am I just chasing the money where the mission is? Those things are hard to figure out. Right. But back to your question, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I applied to you for a grant uh, this year, and I receive it from you. Mm -hmm. uh, two, three years down the line, I find something else I want to do. Can I come back to you, or should I do it somewhere else? Why not? I would say, of course. Were you successful? Yeah. <laughs> did I feel good about my investment of money in your organization? Did, did we together start to address a need in the community? Come back and let's do it again. Let's mm -hmm. continue working together. So I'm, I'm not I'm not looking out. I'm not so much considering what it did for me, but rather what it did for you. Yep. And yep. that's that's where I should start in the beginning. Yep. Okay. And you know, most funders are not once and done. If they find something that works, they want to keep at it. Um, the exception to that might be local businesses, local uh, corporations that want to spread their money around. And they may say, we don't want to see a repeat 
application for X number of years because we want to give other people an opportunity. They're pretty explicit about that right up front. Um, and I think we're just about to the end. We have maybe one more slide. Sarah? Okay, yep, the summary. These are the takeaways. Get organized in the beginning. Um, design a strong project. Redesigning is necessary. That might be about, that's what we're talking about with the need statements. Think about what you're trying to do and who the population is you're trying to serve. You know, you've really got your project oriented in the way it gets to a community need. Do your homework. Every application has different requirements. Steve and I were talking again over the break about how handy it is to have a template for that project with all the information in there. And then no matter who you're, to whom you're applying, you can pull that need statement out and adapt it. You know, maybe you're only allowed to use three sentences in this application and maybe they want a page and a half over here, but you've got the crux of that need statement in place and you can put that into wherever you want to go. The staffing needs, the budget, those kinds of things. So as you're developing a project for funding, you can think about that stuff up front. And then just keep trying. And you know, the one thing that we didn't really talk about here, um, and I, I usually get more of it than I got from this group, is um, well, we, just need, we just need money. You know, we just need money. We want, we want money to keep us going as an organization. Very few funders out there are really interested in just helping you stay alive. They want to fund those specific projects. But I think that's something that, that you folks get right away. And um, you have some great projects in this room, so I really I wish you the best with us. We're winding up just a little bit early, so if there are any more questions, be glad to, uh, to take them. Or if I've filled your brains with enough for one day, um, go by venison and salt. <laughs>